All right, I think we're live, everyone. Um, good morning, I'm Stacey Brenner, and today I'll be presiding over uh, three work sessions um, for the Joint Standing Committee on the Environment and Natural Resources. It is Wednesday, March 24th. Um, and this format is new to all of us. Um, can we, maybe it's not so new anymore, right? Um, there may be unforeseen glitches and mistakes, but please be patient. We're doing our best and we will learn as we go and hopefully improve along the way. So thank you for your patience with our process. Um, the purpose of this meeting is for the committee to receive information from staff and others in order for members to consider the legislative proposals before them and make recommendations or reports to the legislature. Only committee members, the committee analysts, and those specifically invited to attend will be participating in the work session using Zoom. For members of the public wishing to observe this meeting, it is being live streamed on the committee's YouTube channel and will be recorded for viewing after this meeting is concluded. We're also broadcasting the audio of this meeting at the legislature's website, www.legislature.main.gov. All right, and just a reminder that the chat feature will only be used for logistics and not for anything substantive. And if you're in the attendee space, uh, if you could make sure that you have your screen labeled with your name and not with something like iPhone 6 or mom's laptop, that would be appreciated. So in case we need to move you into the committee space to help answer some questions, we know who you are. All right, and if you're having any technical difficulties, you can always contact our committee clerk, Sabrina, um, or the Legislative Information Technology Office if necessary. Okay, so let's go forward with introductions and we'll start with Representative Bell. Uh, good morning, uh, Art Bell. I represent House District 47, which is Yarmouth, Shabik, and Long Island. Thank you. And Representative Gramlich. Thank you, Senator. Good morning. I am Lori Gramlich, and I represent House District 13, which is the lovely seaside community of Old Orchard Beach. And Representative Ziegler. Good morning. I'm Representative Paige Ziegler. I represent the seven towns in Walla County of Belmont, Liberty, Lincolnville, Muffalmoro, Palermo, and Searsmont. I'm wearing my seagrass tie today for the bill. And Representative O'Connor. Good morning, I'm Beth O'Connor. I represent the individuals of House District 5, which is Barwick and part of North Barwick. And Representative Dudera has arrived and we'll ask her to introduce herself next. Thank you very much, everybody. Good morning, I am Vicki Dudera. I represent House District 94, Camden, Rockport, and the lovely island of Islesboro. Senator Bennett. Thank you, uh, Senator Brenner. I'm Rick Bennett. I uh, represent 13 towns in Western Maine in, Bridge, uh, in uh, Oxford and Cumberland counties, the foothills and the lakes region. And my co-chair, Representative Tucker. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ralph Tucker. I represent uh, Brunswick in the legislature, uh, House District 50. Thank you. And my name is Stacey Brenner. I represent Senate District 30, which is the towns of Gorham, uh, most of Scarborough and most of Buxton. And we have with us today, Deirdre Snyder, who is our OPLA analyst and Sabrina Carey, who is our clerk. And as always, we are grateful for your support. Um, and, I, oh, and Dan Tartikoff's here too. He's our other OPLA analyst. Um, so with that, we're gonna open a work session on LD 593, an act to restore regular eelgrass mapping in the state. Good morning. So this bill directs the Department of Environmental Protection in consultation with the Department of Marine Resources to establish and administer a program to regularly produce and update maps regarding the distribution of eelgrass beds in the state. The bill establishes a mapping schedule and requires that maps for each designated coastal portion be updated every five years. It also requires the data collected and maps produced under this program 
must be made available on the department's website. The department is directed to submit beginning March 1st, 2023 and biannually, biannually thereafter a report to the Joint Standing Committee of the Legislature having jurisdiction over environmental and natural resources matters on the data collected and maps produced and updated under this program. It also creates the Eelgrass Mapping Fund to support the establishment and administration of the Eelgrass Mapping Program and authorizes the fund to accept grants, requests, gifts, or contributions from any source, public or private. The bill contains an appropriations and allocation section containing three initiatives. The first initiative provides an allocation for the Eelgrass Mapping Fund so that grants, requests, gifts, or contributions can be accepted into the fund. The second initiative provides appropriations for two positions at DEP, and the third initiative provides appropriations for aerial imagery, acquisition, and processing and annual equipment maintenance and replacement. I have a little hist history. Um, during the 129th legislature, LD 559 was before the ENR committee. The committee voted unanimously ought to pass as amended. The amendment included the addition of the eelgrass mapping fund and the appropriations and allocation section, including the same initiatives contained in this bill. The amended version of LD 559 is the same proposal as LD 593 before you today. That bill died on the special appropriations table upon adjournment last legislature. Um, the sponsor at, before the public hearing also had distributed an amendment to the bill and the, this amendment would add salt marsh vegetation mapping and this addition would not require additional resources. At the public hearing, several people spoke in favor of the bill. There were no opponents and the department testified neither for nor against. Um, within the testimony received by the committee, there were two um, people who offered amendments to the bill. The first was Christina Real de Azua, and I'm sorry if I butchered that name. Um, and she had proposed accelerating the mapping timetable contained within the bill, include all brackish tidal areas, which can be reached far inland given Maine's complex coastline, and direct DEP to develop a plan to address the problems contributing to eelgrass loss. And Sebastian Bell from the Maine Aquaculture Association requested if moving forward with the proposal to include a procedure and policy for removal of non-existent eelgrass beds from the database and maps so that no go zones are not created in perpetuity. Um, for fiscal impact, we haven't received the preliminary fiscal impact statement. However, the bill does contain an appropriations and allocation section that totals in 2021-22. $283,243 in general fund money, and in 2022-23, $330,400 in general fund money. Does anyone want to open us up with comments or thoughts? Yes, Representative O'Connor. Thank you. So um, I actually like this bill. And I think that we'll get a lot of a positive rate of return on this small investment. And I think that um, I would make a motion that ought to pass as amended. Yes, Representative Tucker, is that a second? It is. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? All right, are we ready for a vote? Representative Tucker. I just, uh, I would just like to thank very much um, Jay McCray for bringing this bill forward again. Um, the testimony at the hearing was uh, just excellent. There's all kinds of ways that mapping the eelgrass and the marshlands uh, will help uh, both with our fishing industry and also um, uh, for, uh, preserving our shoreline. Uh, I'm really happy that she's brought that back again. Uh, I, I, I know sometimes we, we tend to vote based on things like cost uh, and so forth. And that's, that's a recurrent issue in a, in a committee like ours where we deal with substantive issues dealing with the environment. I would rather see that we here in this committee would decide what's a good bill and what's good for the environment and good for Maine on its own feet without 
trying to be a mini appropriations committee. Um, I think we should decide what is the best thing to do. And then the appropriations committee can decide if the money is there or not. Um, with obviously with our recommendation, but uh, I don't think we should always be deciding on these bills based on the fiscal note. Obviously there's exceptions to that, but uh, I'd like to proceed without a big discussion of the, uh, well, we can have the discussion, but I, I don't think it's particularly relevant to get hung up about the fiscal note. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Tucker. Any other thoughts before we move forward? Yes, Representative O'Connor. Whoops, you're on mute, Representative. Thank you, Representative Tucker. I'm very sorry, but I will always get stuck on fiscal notes. Anyone else? Okay, Sabrina, I believe we are ready for a vote. And the question is, uh, 593 ought to pass as amended. Great. Senator Brenner. Yes. Representative Tucker. Yes. Senator Bennett. Yes. Representative Hanley. Absent. Senator Carney. Absent. Representative Bell. Yes. Representative Bloom. Absent. Representative Dudera. Yes. Representative Gramlich. Yes. Representative Johansson. Absent. Representative O'Connor. Yes. Representative Toole. Absent, Representative Ziegler. Yes. Eight yes, five absent. Great. Thank you everyone. And with that, I believe we will close the work session on LB 593. And we will move on to a work session for LD 602, an act to prevent pollution from single use plastic straws, splash sticks and beverage plugs. And I think we'll pass it back. Oh, is this, Dan, is this? Sorry, um, did you wanna review that 390 letter right now or do you want to later? I'm sorry, you, you here. broke up. Can you say that one more time? The 390 letter. I'm so review the me... LD 390 letter. Representative Tucker, did you have a comment? Yes, uh, because Deidre Schneider is here and she oh, shared the letter, it might be nice to have her um, present the letter and, uh, you know, just tell us about it and, uh, this is the letter that's going to go to the uh, DEP concerning uh, shoreline zoning problems that um, Representative Ann Perry brought to us. We killed the bill, mm -hmm. but also said we wanted the DEP to do more in terms of coordination. Great. And so if uh, Deidre could present the letter, we can, it, the letter is fine as far as I can see. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So I sent a letter to everybody via email yesterday and it's basically asking the um, DEP to see what other options there may be regarding the use of GIS mapping to consult with the office of GIS and see what are the existing data layers that can help communities and the opportunities for future data collection that could benefit municipalities and then share that information with regional planning organizations including the Washington County, County Council of Government. Um, so the letter is just directing the DEP to, to look into this further and seeing if there's ways to make it a little bit easier for these people to have access to data layers and to do their mapping for shoreland zoning. Any questions or comments about that letter? 
All right, Deirdre, thank you. I'm sorry I, I um, missed that note of order given your schedule this morning. Oh, that's okay. I wasn't sure what we were doing anyway, so no problem. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. All right, so then we are gonna move on to LD602 and Dan, I'm assuming that's on your screen share, correct? Uh, yes, I'm going to walk us through it. And, uh, analysis for that. Are you able to he hear and see my now? I, I feel like my internet is having issues. I think you're gonna to need to turn your video off because you're doing that sort of verbal pixelation thing, which is a bummer because we always like to see you, Dan. And can you hear me now? Is that any better? It's better, but still spotty. Um, we'll give it a try and see how it goes. Dan looks like he's on mute. Yep. Dan, you are. Uh, can you hear me? We can now, yep. I think he's gonna to try to restart his computer and see if he can address the issue. If worse comes to worse, I can go through his analysis if Thank needed. Thank you, Deirdre. We'll be patient. Excuse me, Madam Chair. May yes. I, uh, shall I introduce myself being late in the meantime? Oh, welcome, yes, please do. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm Representative Lydia Bloom. I represent House District 3 in York. We're glad to have you this morning, Representative Bloom. Dan apologizes. He's seeing if he can get this glitch fixed out. Um, he's going to keep me posted of what's going on.
All right, I'm back. Can anyone hear me? <laughs> you sound like clear as a bell. Okay, I, I don't know what was happening there. I reset all my devices and modem and router and anyways, I'll try doing it without video just to make sure. Is it all okay? Great. Um, so I assume you got the, the bill analysis for 602? Yes, I received it. Okay. <clears throat> Did you want me to go through that? I think it would be helpful, yes. Sure, so this is LD602, an act to prevent pollution from single-use plastic straws, splash sticks, and beverage lid plugs. Uh, that's Senator Meerman's bill. Beginning January 1st, 2022, this bill prohibits the manufacture and the sale and distribution at retail or wholesale of single-use drinking straws, splash sticks, and beverage lid plugs made wholly or partly of plastic, and prohibits food establishments and eating establishments from providing such items to customers at a point of sale or otherwise making such items available to customers. Food establishments and eating establishments are authorized under the bill to provide only upon the request of a customer and only at a point of sale, single-use drinking straws, splash sticks, or beverage lid plugs not made of plastic, as long as they collect a fee from the customer of not less than five cents for each such item provided. Such establishments are authorized to retain and use such collected fees for any lawful purpose. Uh, I've made a note here because it seemed like there was some confusion um, during the public hearing. There are three distinct prohibitions in the bill, as well as a fee requirement. They all take effect January 1st, 2022. There is a manufacturing prohibition, which says that a person may not manufacture single-use plastic beverage ware for sale or distribution. There's a sales prohibition, which says a person may not sell or distribute in Maine at wholesale or retail single-use plastic beverage ware. There are uh, some limited exceptions that I've noted there. There's a food or eating establishment prohibition, which uh, prohibits food or eating establishments from providing single-use plastic beverage ware to customers. And then there's a fee requirement that uh, requires <coughs> food or eating establishments to collect a five cent fee per item of beverage ware provided to customers um, only at the point of sale, only upon request, and these are non-plastic beverage ware. Uh, I've noted here that the terms food establishment and eating establishment, um, which that third prohibition and the fee requirement apply to, are um, cross-referenced in the bill and defined in Title 22. Uh, I've put the full definitions at the end of the analysis if anyone wants to refer to that. I've noted here there was uh, a number of proponents and opponents uh, and those neither for nor against. Um, Hearing testimony noted that similar proposals have been enacted in a number of different jurisdictions. Although there was some discrepancies in the information provided, it appears that at least eight states have adopted laws regulating the use of plastic straws or are considering adopting such policies. Many of these states have implemented so-called straw by request policies, which was discussed some during the hearing. Um, there are also apparently more than 100 local jurisdictions, um, mostly municipalities in the U.S., that have adopted some form of plastic straw regulation. In its written testimony, the DEP questioned whether there may need to be further clarification in the bill uh, on two issues. One, what constitutes an allowable non-plastic alternative? This was a question about the definition of the, of the word plastic in the bill and what constitutes a point of sale as it relates to the food and eating establishment provisions. The Conservation Law Foundation and the Food Service Packaging Institute both proposed replacing the bill with a straw by request policy only. In other words, food and eating establishments would only be allowed to provide a single use plastic straw to a customer upon request. Um, the Conservation Law Foundation at least provided specific proposed language to accomplish that. Uh, Disability Rights Maine proposed exempting persons with disabilities from the fee requirement. There were multiple other individuals who expressed support for including exemptions for persons with disabilities. Um, some of those comments were not just limited to the fee requirement. The Food Service Packaging Institute and the Lakes Environmental Association proposed striking the five cent fee for non-plastic straws. Hospitality Maine and the Maine Tourism Association proposed replacing the bill with a voluntary education-based program or initiative relating to plastic straws that would have DEP monitoring and oversight and that would be targeted at food service businesses and their customers. 
Hospitality Maine also um, alternatively supported extending the implementation date of the prohibition to a date later than January 1st, 2022, removing the five cent fee provision and exempting from the prohibitions under the bill, the sale of drinks prepackaged with a straw, the sale of bulk packages of straws by food or beverage producers uh, to, uh, to include an allowance for use during a declared emergency and to include an allowance for use by individuals who require a straw for consuming beverages. That was sort of the disability exemption, ADA compliance issue that was described by others. Um, the Maine Grocers and Food Producers Association proposed exempting from the sale or distribution prohibition, any beverages sold prepackaged with a straw. Those are currently included under the prohibition. And a company called Windcup Incorporated um, proposed allowing for the sale and use of straws made from biopolymer based products that are compostable and marine degradable. There are multiple other individuals who expressed support for that kind of an amendment. Um, there was some information provided to the committee subsequent to the hearing by Windcup regarding the compostability and biodegradability of uh, PHA or what they're calling fade straws and stirs. Uh, I had attached that information to the, to the email I just sent you. Um, there's no information, fiscal information yet available from OFPR. Uh, I have noted here that the DEP in its written testimony uh, included the following statement that based in part upon the department's experience with implementation of the plastic bag and polystyrene bans, we would expect that implementation of this law would require a fairly significant effort in terms of providing clarification, guidance, public information, and compliance oversight, and the bill would likely carry a fiscal note. And then beyond that is just the definitions of food establishment and eating establishment. So uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Are there any questions of Dan by the committee? Yes, Representative Bell. Uh, have we learned at all from the experience uh, down in Portland? They, uh, they had a phased in a um, plastic straw uh, by request only, I believe, for the first phase uh, back in April of last year. And then I think at the beginning of this year, they are now banning plastic straws altogether. Um, have we learned anything from the city of Portland um, that could be uh, pertinent to what we're talking about today? That, I mean, that's, that's something that individuals did bring up. A number of individuals brought up during the hearing. Um, it's not something I'm intimately familiar with and we didn't hear specifically from, I don't believe we heard from any municipalities. I might be wrong on that, but um, there, were, there were certainly some testimony referring to the Portland uh, ordinance. Representative Tucker. Thank you. Uh, would it be appropriate at this time to ask the sponsor if he could join us? Uh, Senator Merriman is in the attendees column and I'm, I'm very curious as to how he plans to navigate this bill and whether there are negotiations going, going on with the different interested parties. That sounds like a great idea. I always love seeing Senator Merriman. So, Sabrina, can you bring him him up? Oh, here he comes. Welcome, Senator Miramont. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, committee. Uh, I've been listening to you and I heard those different suggestions and objections. And as usual, this bill tried to cover everything, cover pieces that we found elsewhere, cover the changes that are necessary to move out of this high level of pollution, plastic pollution, particularly that's what this one is. But the this is going to be one of those things that keeps coming back without end until we get it right. But we wanted everything in there and we're certainly willing to let go of a piece here or there until it's figured out, uh, take any suggestions from what has or hasn't worked all of that's possible. And I didn't know if you folks would be the ones suggesting those and putting them in, which would be fine. Or if you'd like to postpone this for, I'd probably say two weeks, but a week would probably do. 
I could try to take that back to the group of people that have been working with me and have them come back with the ways to merge the different ideas together, some of which I know will be rejected. But the we could bring it back to you with a little more comprehensive language based on what you were just discussing in that analysis. Yeah. I have a recommendation, Senator, that I would love to see. Um, we heard from Curtis Picard and Christine Cummings. Um, and I think given the success of negotiating the plastic bag ban with NRCM and the, and the industry um, folks, it would be interesting to see what you could do with both groups to try to find a balance between business and the environment and consumer um, interests. Um, and if there was the possibility of navigating some sort of middle ground here where we could um, protect the environment, but also um, not severely damage business in the process. So that would be my suggestion is if we could table the bill for a handful of weeks so that you have a moment to perhaps coordinate so that those conversations and find a balance. Representative Judera. Thank you, Chair Brenner and um, welcome Senator Miramont. Um, I, I like this bill, I mean, I, I feel like this is definitely needed. I, I ha was happy to co-sponsor this with Senator Miramont, um, but I do agree with what Chair Brenner has said that, you know, I'd, I'd like a little bit more time to study what they've done in Portland because it seems to be working well, at least that's what it seems to be. I'd like to know that if it, if it is or it isn't. And I am sensitive to um, the businesses that are in my district that have had such a hard time, uh, the tourism businesses and doing what we can to help them, um, you know, phase it in or you know, make some changes. So I, I, I agree with what's being said. I think that you know, taking a little bit more time to work on this, we can really get it right. Thank you. And Senator, Representative, uh, thank you. And Senator, what was the other, you said NRCM, who else did you want us to include in figuring this out? Um, Curtis Picard represents the Retail Association and then Christine Cummings represents um, uh, uh, grocer, food grocers, I believe. She's actually, let's, let's bring her in. She's in the attendee space. I, that way you can um, at least set eyes on each other and um, perhaps uh, start the early collaboration together. Great. So let's see if I can get her in here. Sabrina, we're looking to bring Christine Cummings into the conversation. Oh, there she is. Oh. Okay, great. Thank you, Sabrina. Welcome, Ms. Cummings. Good morning, Senator. So I'm hoping that perhaps we can get you and Senator Miramont together um, and NRCM to work together. Um, how do you feel about pathways forward? Yes, that's very much so appreciated. Um, I know we did some initial reach out to some of the committee members um, looking to find a path forward. So we appreciate the opportunity to work through some of the complexities. Great. Senator Bennett has a question, a comment. Yeah, it's more of a comment. I, you know, I just think it's helpful with people going off to work on stuff to hear from committee members and what our thinking is that uh, keeping an open mind, obviously, uh, for and awaiting as much information as one can hope for. Um, I, I really, I, I think this is an admirable uh, bill in, directionally. I mean, we, we really do need to deal with this issue. Um, I have a lot of concern about doing so right now. I mean, the, the people that will be, the businesses that will be most affected by this over the, the shorter term are, are businesses that have just been absolutely hammered uh, by the pandemic. And, you know, I think about our restaurants, our food service um, companies, 
And, you know, we, I, we just need to be very, very cautious about imposing burdens on them right now as they, you know, we've lost a lot of them, frankly, but as those others that are trying to recover, I think it's really important to, um, to, 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 to go slow on this. And so I, I would just simply voice my, my concern about doing an outright ban, some of the longer um, so, some of the, the more, um, I, I would say, aggressive uh, parts of the, of the bill. Um, I, I like the idea of going slow, doing something more on the educational side, trying to put us in a posture over the next couple of years where we can then move to the next phase. Um, and I also think there's a lot of consciousness raising going on across the world and particularly in our country about this problem. And um, as much as I like to move uh, aggressively on certain things, this, uh, I, just, I just worry about, uh, about being, going a little too much too fast here. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Representative Tucker and then Representative O'Connor. I just want to make a more specific comment. I think that the five cents is a non-starter. I don't think you're going to find any support uh, for that. And Representative O'Connor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would agree with Representative Tucker that the five cents is definitely a non-starter for me. And as far as the choice policies, I really don't have a problem with any choice policy. In fact, uh, most of my adult life, I have been in the food service industry. I have seen them absolutely take a beating over the years. But for the past, um, I worked for a very busy family restaurant and we always had a choice policy, whether it be for uh, plastic takeout wear, um, whether it be for extra an extra napkin, whether it be for straws, anything. And the reason that we did it, it was completely voluntary before any of this hoopla came forward. We did it because we wanted to save money because the more money that we save, the more our employees get paid. Thank you. Any additional comments? I'll give you my opinion. So I run a wedding venue and I've banned stirs, straws at my venue along with single use disposable water bottles because I'm tired of managing the waste and having trouble communicating with wedding guests the proper disposal of each of the things that they're using when they're a guest. So it's been easy for me as a business to transition away from those products. However, I do recognize that not every business is ready for this. And I think the implementation date is a little too soon. So that along with the fee for me don't feel quite right. Um, but I look forward to what you can come up with together between uh, the environmental organizations and the business group to find a pathway forward so that at least we can start to encourage a transition away from plastic straws. Thank you. Any other comments before we have a motion to perhaps table this bill until we have more information? Yes, Dan. Um, Senator Meerman's probably already aware of this, but to the extent he wants any assistance in drafting any proposed amendments, I'm available. That's Thank what we you. love about you, Dan. <laughs> Any other thoughts? So I'll make a motion that we table the bill. And we could just do a show of hands. Representative Hanley, we're voting to table the straw bill. Excuse me, I didn't understand what you said. We're voting to table the bill to ban straws, plug cups, and splash sticks. I will uh, go in the affirmative with that. All right. So I think we're I think we're good there. All righty. So that closes our public hearing. Thank you, Senator Miramont. Thank Thanks you. We'll get us. right on it. 
And uh, thanks right. for the input and talk to you soon. So between marine uh, hearings, you can fit this one in, I hope. Absolutely, thank you. Okay, take care. <laughs> so that ends the work session on LD602. And now we will open a work session on LD226. And we'll pass it over to Dan to walk us through. So I just sent you uh, a bill analysis and a couple additional documents. And I'll go through that bill analysis now. Uh, LD226 is an act to limit the use of hydrofluorocarbons to fight climate change. This is a DEP bill presented by Representative Tucker. As introduced by Representative Tucker at the public hearing, he has proposed an amendment that replaces the bill and builds off of the committee amendment to LD2112, uh, which had the same title and was the predecessor bill to this LD that was voted during but ultimately not enacted by the 129th legislature prior to final adjournment. His amendment provides that in accordance with the rules adopted by the DEP, a person may not sell, lease, rent, install, or enter into commerce in the state, a product or equipment that uses or will use certain specified substances that are hydrofluorocarbons with high global warming potential for certain specified air conditioning, refrigeration, foam, or aerosol propellant end uses. Those specified substances and specified end uses that are prohibited under the amendment as well as specified exemptions to those prohibitions are identical or substantially similar to those provided for in the bill. Uh, and I've noted here that unless otherwise indicated, the analysis refers to the proposed amendment rather than the original printed version. And the amendment was what we sought to receive testimony on at the public hearing. There was a lot of testimony received on this bill. Um, the first note I've included uh, in my analysis is uh, about other state action in response to member questions at the hearing regarding other state action on this matter. Um, multiple entities provided information in response. From the information, it appears that at least 12 other states have enacted similar legislation to 226 uh, and or have adopted or in the process of adopting similar or related regulations. There are two states that considered but did not enact similar legislation in 2020. Uh, so the rest of this analysis is identifying specific proposed amendments by various groups um, at the public hearing. Uh, would you like me to go through those now or do you, I don't know how you want to take everything up um, to, to, for the format of this work session? Well, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot to go through. Representative Tucker, Whoops, you're on mute, Representative. Uh, my suggestion would be that we don't get into the 15 or 16 different uh, amendments, use most of them minor amendments that were proposed at this work session, perhaps in the future. I would uh, like to jump right into a new issue that's been brought up and um, not take a vote today and think about what we're gonna hear today, um, if that's agreeable with the committee. Okay. All right. Um, Madam, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, excuse me. Representative Hanley. Yes. Whoops, you're on mute, Representative. I have a guest that I've asked to come and give us some information today, Jim Lebrec. Mm -hmm. I believe he's standing by, if that's possible. Can we listen to his presentation? Yes, we um, are planning to bring him in. Representative Tucker. Um, while we're waiting for Mr. Lebrec to uh, come in, um, I'd like to make a motion ought to pass for LD226 and speak to my motion uh, before the presentation. Yes, please. Do we need a second before you can speak to your motion? Second. Great. Okay. Um, 
As I said, uh, we have a brand new issue before us to talk about. So I suggest no vote today so that the new information can sink in with everyone. Um, many anxious main businesses have learned that currently installed equipment using HFC are grandfathered as long as they were manufactured by various deadlines in the law, some are to uh, 2022, some 2023, some 2024. And they're gra grandfathered for the lifetime of the equipment. So our boat builders, restaurants, farms, supermarkets have been assured that the equipment they currently have will continue. Now, there are a number of concerns. There are 15 or 16 amendments about waivers, about conformity to the EPA, about fire codes. Uh, these are being considered. Some have been solved, some have been compromised. For example, the Marine, um, the boat builders have learned all about the exemptions that exist at the federal level. And we're preempted on that. However, we received a recent letter from Representative Lyford, and he's brought up the, a brand new conceptual question. And it's this, the question is if, if future non HFC equipment use takes more energy to run and are less energy efficient Will this lead to higher emissions of CO2 to supply energy for them and thus wipe out the benefits of the HFC reduction? Of course, this leads to two questions. First, are the alternatives in the future to this equipment less energy efficient? And has anyone been thinking about this? Secondly, should the bill be amended to assess the net greenhouse gas effects of different models of equipment? And what have other states done? We have several witnesses who are here today to address these and related questions. And I would now turn this back to uh, Representative Hanley. Thank you, Representative Tucker. Dan, did you have a, uh, an addition? I, I just wanted to clarify. Um, I assume, Representative Tucker, your motion was ought to pass as amended by your proposed amendment that was distributed at the hearing. Is that correct? Yes. OK. So Mr. Lebrecht, before you get started, I um, understand you have some slides to share. I just want to let you know that we will be holding you to a strict 10 minute time frame, and um, look forward to hearing what you have to say and hope that you'll make sure to email us those slides. I hear you have 40, which will be hard to get through in 10 minutes, but perhaps you can email them along for us to all consider if you don't mind. You're on mute, Mr. LeBrecht. There we go. There we go. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Very good. Representative Hanley, gonna... did, you have a, did you have anything additional to add before we get started, Representative Hanley? Yeah, yes, if I might. Uh, Mr. LeBrecht, uh, I think probably should start by introducing himself and giving to all of us his history of the type of work he does and the uh, the fields that he's been engaged in all his life so that we all will recognize that you, this is an expert witness you're about to listen to and uh, we'd be we do uh, our citizens are just a uh, true justice to listen to him and, and pay attention to what he has to say and then I'll, I'll be quiet and let him come up with the information he has thanks great thank you so much yeah. representative all right mr lebrecht thank you um I uh, am going to make a presentation uh, that is going to turn the uh, industry uh, in the right direction, hopefully. Maine can lead the rest of the nation. The problem is not uh, chemicals. The problem is uh, 
is mechanical. And I'll explain that in my presentation. <clears throat> but uh, uh, can, can you see my presentation material? Can you see the slides? Yes, you can. Okay, very good. So anyways, I'm here to talk about, uh, oh, uh, let me put it on. Uh, is that better? Can you see that better? Very That's good. Much, uh, okay, great. very good. So uh, refrigeration environment, I'm gonna give you a quick uh, run through a whole bunch of slides. I'm gonna go through them quick, but it's going to make an impression of what the real problem is and it's gonna make a solid case for it. Okay, the, uh, the environmental issue from refrigerants is a mechanical issue, not a chemical issue. This is gonna be one of the biggest things. I've been in this business and I had, uh, I had patented solutions that I sold for seven figure digit uh, on my uh, technology to reduce the hole in the ozone. And I've been at this uh, since the 60s. So I have quite a bit of experience in that, in that, in that ground, real world experience, real systems. And uh, what you're gonna see will uh, support that. Uh, the industry in a document they've supplied to you said, we are pleased to share that the federal transition will shrink US annual greenhouse gas emissions by around 2.5 four billion metric tons of carbon dioxide, that's five trillion pounds uh, by 2036. So my question is, what will the unforeseen consequences for needless mechanical leaks be for the next generation of chemicals? A hole in the ozone being the first consequence and equivalent CO2 consequences being the second that we're facing now, what's the third consequence gonna be? The problem is not chemicals. We have a lot of chemicals in this world. It's just that only this industry is allowed to leak them out at the rate of billions of pounds a year. Okay, and chemical companies have no interest in addressing the real problem, which is refrigerant leaks, because they make billions by selling refrigerants for leaky systems It will continue continue to do so after the passing of LD226 if the real problem leaks is not addressed. What other industry is allowed to leak millions of metric tons of super potent chemicals into our environment without consequences? I, somebody had asked in the uh, hearings last week uh, about heat pump leaks and why it's exempt. The calculations I ran, one heat pump, and I did this calculation back when I put together the heat pump program for Governor LePage. One heat pump filet in that leaking three pounds of refrigerant, that's like three Coke bottles, you know, little 16 ounce Coke bottles of refrigerant is equal to the carbon produced by burning one of those big oil tanks in your cellar, 275 gallons. What people don't realize is the magnitude of this industry. Most anybody that you talk to has never seen the back room or the cellars of big buildings or supermarkets or anything. Here, each one of these big 2,000 ton uh, air conditioning chillers uh, produce more ice than what the city uh, of Bangor did in the late 1800s when it was uh, delivering ice to the world. It was the biggest world producer of ice that they shipped around the world. This gives you an idea of the magnitude of what we're dealing with. Here is the back room of a supermarket. Everybody's familiar with the refrigerated cases out in the supermarket that very few people have ever seen what the back room looks like. And if you look there and you count up every joint, every part, every piece of, uh, of uh, systems that have refrigerant in it and where they leak, that's why they use so much. It's, uh, it's a real quality issue. Uh, here on the left is uh, a typical Walmart store like, and you see all those black pipes coming down that's feeding a section of those refrigerated cases there. They've got tons of those pipes run all over that building. And to the right is inside cases of refrigerated cases in supermarkets that have a tremendous amount of, um, of parts and pieces and that you can't get to and very poor workmanship that cause leaks all the time. Um, new chemicals will continue to leak uh, if the issue of quality is not addressed. Here's inside of uh, a number of cases I don't have time to go into the details, but you don't have to be an engineer or a, a, a piping specialist or anything to see how uh, the low quality of workmanship 
throughout these stores. This is not, I didn't have to go out and work hard to find these pictures. These are everywhere. It's been that way since I started in this business in the 60s. Uh, here's the uh, first generation of refrigeration, the uh, refrigerants le were leaky. The second ger generation, which is now destroying the, uh, uh, you know, the CO2, first generation was destroying the ozone. Uh, the third generation, if you just pass a bill that says we're going to try another chemical, they're also going to leak. Leak is the problem. Uh, right down here uh, is a little fitting for that replaces flare nuts that uh, is a high quality um, machined out piece of uh, product that uh, would really present a lot, a lot of leaks in this industry, but nobody uses it. That comes from Italy. Europe uses it, but not uh, us over here. This is these cases in the store where you buy your produce and your dairy and so forth, brand new cases that were just delivered recently. Look at this case on the left. Uh, this is the quality of the workmanship in this industry right from the manufacturers. See, there's a little under the blue knob, the handle, there's a little valve there. That's the access valve you can't even get to to service that thing and to uh, uh, pull the refrigerant out of it or to service it. Look at the picture on the right, uh, just pipes twist it around and haphazardly, uh, you know, put in uh, the manufactured. It's uh, the whole industry is in chaos. Here's a medium-sized supermarket. This is uh, probably like a uh, twenty thousand square foot supermarket. Or uh, yeah, and uh, look at all all of the equipment. This is just a piece of it. I could take and give you a ton of pictures that. Uh, show all the details of uh, stuff throughout the store. This is in the back of your little grocery store that you would look, typically shop in. And you look at all the parts and pieces and now you, and the workmanship that's there, when you have a chance to look at these slides on your own at your own time, I hope you look at all the details and think about how just new chemicals are gonna leak out of all these systems as well. Here's another medium-sized supermarket. When you look at this equipment scattered all over uh, a, a building, inside, outside, up on the roof, out the back of the store, uh, not only that, but it's very inefficient when you have all these units outside, all the heat is being thrown outside. And uh, each one of those compressors is basically a little uh, oil field in itself. Um, here's a small supermarket. And uh, look at, this is in the basement of a small supermarket that's uh, 5,000 square feet. And uh, look at all of the equipment here. And most notably, look down here to the left. These are all the different replacement alternatives that that one little store has been using. Uh, and they got, I think, seven different refrigerants. The, the original refrigerants and then the substitutes that were to take care of those. And then when those when they found problems with those refrigerants, they uh, come up with new refrigerants. But look at all the piping and all of the poor quality work in uh, these in this industry. Uh, here's another small supermarket. Uh, this is an older one, but uh, again, it just gives you an idea. Here's unitary, you know, small units like uh, uh, the unit way here on the left that's uh, being cleaned as a uh, goes to a pizza counter. Uh, the one in the middle is a national uh, uh, restaurant, uh, just sitting at the uh, counter, eating and uh, looked at that and said, I gotta get a picture of that. To the right is a sandwich uh, counter in a local uh, 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 store that makes uh, pizzas and sandwiches. Uh, the quality of the workmanship here and leaks and so forth are just going to continuously prevail with, without you know, just with new chemicals. Uh, here's a heat pump uh, that there's a commercial heat pump. Look at this, the uh, quality of the uh, serviceability and the uh, design and manufacturing. You can't even get your hand in to fix a leak. And if it isn't, a big, then they don't bother. Hey, Frank, to I'm good, just going to interrupt you because the, the 10 minutes is up. And okay. I was hoping perhaps you could wrap it up and um, share your thoughts for um, how you would like to see this legislation um, go forward. Okay, so uh, what I'd uh, 
some of the solutions are we have uh, uh, piping systems, uh, professional companies that do uh, piping and check everything with helium. You know, you have a lot of industries, they never have a leak, especially the nuclear power industry or whatever. Uh, all preformed piping and there's a lot of uh, solutions. I build a little thing that you hang there on the left, uh, a little teeny module, four of those with just two pipes in it, run the whole supermarket uh, and, uh, and we transfer the heat via water and these things hang in supermarkets like that. These are the water pump systems and the uh, towers outside. And uh, I think, uh, uh, and I have, you can go down to here without explanations. The, uh, uh, I want to point out one very important thing. If you look at this slide where it says 407F, uh, the thread to the, from the left, uh, that's the global warming potential of the chemical I'm using versus this other chemical, 448A, the reason why I'm using one with a higher global warming potential than the one that this bill you pass would uh, force me to use is because of the additional energy and the additional pounds of refrigerant I need uh, is uh, going to kill the uh, uh, is going to kill the whole uh, uh, environmental impact. So let me just look at this next slide and uh, one other this, and then I'll conclude. Uh, if my system, this is, I put things in equivalent to how many solar panels you would need to offset the harm from my system, which is 432 solar panels, whereas a new system going in today uh, would take 1,631 panels. But if I was forced to use this one way on the right, which is the refrigerant I'd be forced to use, I would go from 432 panels up to almost 1,200 panels. Uh, we don't want to be taking a step backwards, but there's uh, a lot to do with looking at the total carbon contribution from uh, electricity and uh, the refrigerants. And uh, if you uh, look at uh, these graphs here, it'll just show you uh, how much has contributed to electricity, carbon going out the smokestack. So if we use more electricity for these refrigerants, you got to put more uh, carbon out the smokestack, and if you need more pounds of it, uh, you're not getting ahead. So who's going to take responsibility for leaking millions of pounds of the next chemical fix if, if LD226 is passed? Let's take our time and think through real solutions. I appreciate you giving me this time. I'm sorry I had to hurry so fast, but in the meantime, uh, if you have any questions, I would be also glad to uh, talk. Uh, Devin, how do I get back on? Great, thank you so much, Mr. Lebrec. And I believe Representative Judera has a question for you. There we go. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lebrec, for coming and, and giving us this presentation. Um, I just, when you brought up the ice, I just have to comment quickly that in my district, Lily Pond in Rockport at one time had supposedly the clearest ice in the country. And you could, you could read if a coin was heads or tails, if it was on the bottom of Lily Pond where they cut the ice. Anyway, that just made me think of that. But my question is, um, what has been the response when you have talked to um, supermarkets and small grocery stores about um, about the leaking the leaks and uh, you know I'm just curious as to what they have said all right so we have two classes of people I uh, have these uh, development systems these little teeny boxes that get distributed around the store and then we flow water we pump water around that does all the heat transfer instead of hundreds of pipes right and uh, the, there's a, a, some people that are very concerned about the environment and what it's going to cost them knowing that things are, you, they just can't continue doing this. So uh, I have a number of supermarkets that are in and some going in right now, uh, which is good. But the ones that haven't taken it are the ones that say, oh, I don't want anything new. I'm a grocer. I don't know anything about this stuff. I don't even want to look out there. And it's just a necessary evil. I just want to go with whatever we've been doing all these years and uh, I don't want to try anything new. So that's the response. Thank you. Representative Hanley. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Lebrec. It was a great presentation and we all have slides to look at and read, so. But I think what you're trying to say is that 
without an engineering fix uh, to the systems that are going to be produced in the future, um, if we keep building with the same materials and same techniques, we're still going to leak any refrigerant, no matter what it is. Is that true? That's absolutely true. It's uh, the problem is is that when it's cheaper to continue leak leak out the stuff rather than fix the problem, uh, that's where the problem is. A follow up, if I may. So, I mean, should should legislation be directed more towards requiring equipment to meet standards of uh, workmanship and material durability? Is that rather than forcing uh, the use of a chemical inside an inferior system, would it be better to look more towards a, an engineering fix? Yes, any of the outdated chemicals that have been outdated since the hole in the ozone and, and all the way up to today would work just fine. It wouldn't be an environmental hazard if we weren't leaking out billions of metric tons all over the world. But that's what they're doing. There is no other industry I can name. I hope, but I don't think anybody in this environmental committee could name any industry that is allowed to leak out billions of metric tons of super potent chemicals without anybody uh, raising uh, some real concerns. And so we have to stop the leaks. I don't care what the chemical is, the next chemicals are gonna cause more problems again. Representative Haley, did you have another follow up? Uh, no, thank you very much. Thank you. Representative O'Connor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Lebrecht, for that presentation. It was really interesting. Um, I have a couple of questions, if I might. So my concerns are, are often with small businesses. They want to replace their equipment, but a lot of times there isn't the money to replace their equipment. Um, and I understand the cost of, of doing business, but it seems that if we're going to be... Um, we can't mandate that people change out their equipment. And I understand that's a necessity, but how would you suggest that people would go about this? I, I don't think that we would be able to um, procure state dollars to help with this or have a program that would help with this. So my first question is, is how do we get people to understand the importance of fixing their refrigeration systems? Um, the other question that I have is those chemicals that you, you showed that slide of, I don't know how those are disposed of. They're no longer used. And if the HFCs that are being used now if those are still on hand, how will those be disposed of? And is the other replacement any safer? Because uh, frankly, I don't really trust chemical industries. And I, I probably could go on all day asking you questions, but I'll, I'll just start with those two. Thank you, sir. All right, uh, as far as the chemicals go, uh, they'll recycle those. The leak rate uh, of these systems far exceeds the recovery rate. So if you recover uh, refrigerant from a system, you're going to be uh, decommissioning. Uh, you save that and use it uh, to, you know, fill the systems that have already leaked out the refrigerant. So that's where most of it goes. Now you're supposed to just bring it back to uh, a wholesaler that then sends it back to a chemical company that uh, uh, properly disposes of it. Uh, but uh, because of the price of the stuff, and it's still refrigerant, and there are still old systems that use that same refrigerant, people just save it and use it uh, later on to uh, refill systems. Uh, I forgot what your first question was. Oh, I, I do remember now uh, on, on the cost. This is, uh, there's two ways to go about this. Either make a simple law that says uh, that you can only, um, you can only, you're only allowed to use or buy a certain ratio of refrigerant. You know, if you take 10 pounds in the system, what should that ratio be over the next 15 year life of that system? You know, should you be able to fill it every year? You know, I have systems that were installed over 30 years with my 
first ozone depleting refrigeration fix. And uh, it went 33 years actually without a single leak. This, these things can be done. And in my system here now, I have very few pipes, very few. If non-existing pipes are guaranteed to the customer, that will never leak. A non-existing pipe, non-existing fittings will never leak. And uh, so we have too many pipes. The industry doesn't want to change. And I think the change has to come from legislation, just like with the hole in the ozone. I had a big break when national legislation hit. But I think what's going to be important here is that this committee identifies for the first time nationally that the problem is not chemicals, the problem is mechanical, and that we have to address that. And I'd like to work with this committee to make hit national recognition and get the country moving in the right direction because that's not unique to Maine, these problems I'm showing you, that's nationally. Thank you, Mr. Lebrecht. Representative O'Connor, do you have a follow-up? Um, thank, thank you, Mr. Lebrecht. That was very interesting. And again, I don't think the chemical companies are going to like you too much, but thank you. Well, it's mutual. All right. <laughs> Any additional questions for Mr. Lebrecht? All righty. So I would love to, yes, Representative Tucker. Um. Thank you. I would like to ask some questions of a lady who testified earlier on this bill. Uh, this lady's name is Helen Walter Terranoni. She is the National Vice President for Regulatory Affairs for the Air Conditioning, Heating and Refrigeration Institute that's A-H-R-I. They represent 90% of the original equipment manufacturers in this area. Over 300 of these companies who manufacture the equipment that's gonna be coming. She's been involved in this uh, regulatory area for 12 years. And I'd like to invite her up to address the issues that we've been discussing, and in particular, whether the alternatives in the future, once the old machinery runs its lifetime, whether the future machinery will be less energy efficient and cause a bigger problem with increased CO2. And I'd like to know from her what kind of studies have been done and who's been thinking about this at the national and international level. All right, so we will bring Ms. Helen Walter Terranoni into the Zoom space so that she can answer your questions, Representative Tucker. And Mr. Lebrecht, I'm going to move you back to the attendee space. But before you go, I just want to make sure you know and are aware of the Rural Energy for America program, which is a grant program through the USDA that covers 25% of a business's cost to update their refrigeration. Um, it's, on the, it's from the federal government. So hopefully that might help some of your customers. Um, and it stretches for all of Maine, actually. Um, all right, so we're going to move you back. Thanks for joining us. And Ms. Walter Terranoni, now that you're here, thank you for joining us. And if, I'm not sure if you heard Representative Tucker's questions or if you'd like for him to restate um, his, his question. Thank you. I, I did hear the questions. And I, I also um, could provide some information around federal laws around leaking equipment for refrigeration uh, from a refrigeration perspective. Um, Thank you. So as Representative Tucker mentioned, um, I am the Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at AHRI. Um, and I also need to mention that I, uh, I do sit on the Technical and Economic Assessment Panel for the UN, Montreal Protocol for sub Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer, uh, but I'm not here necessarily representing their views today. Um, uh, so uh, 
uh, Mr. Lebrecht uh, provided some very helpful information uh, that I think uh, is the basis for uh, this type of legislation. So um, uh, I have said many times that uh, if equipment didn't leak, we wouldn't have to keep changing refrigerants. <laughs> so he, he's absolutely, I, I believe he's absolutely correct about that. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, although there have been many voluntary programs, for example, the Green Chill program under the US EPA, um, as well as section 608 of the Clean Air Act, which limits uh, the allowed refrigerant that can leak, um, uh, this has continued to be a problem. Uh, you may be aware of the AIM Act, so the American Innovation and Manufacturing Act that was uh, signed into law late last year, uh, which requires that the U.S. phase down the use of HFCs. Um, uh, it also has requirements that EPA uh, look at the refrigerant management programs, so such as leaking refrigerants, as well as rec reclamation and reuse at after end of life. So. Um, all of those programs are very, very important, and uh, I, I do agree with Mr. Lebrecht that, that this is a major problem, especially for commercial refrigeration equipment that can have leak rates as high as 35%. I will tell you, though, that there are some heroes out there. There are some uh, grocery store chains, who, uh, Whole Foods, uh, Giant, and others, who have taken this matter very, very seriously, and they have worked very hard to reduce their leak rates uh, down to very, very low levels. And... Uh, have behaved in a very, very responsible manner and shown that this can be done and it will actually save them money. Um, uh, so happy, I'm happy to go on and talk more about that if you'd like me to, uh, but, but let me pivot and answer Representative Tucker's questions before I do um, uh, or answer other questions. Um, uh, from an energy efficiency perspective, uh, uh, you may know that the Montreal Protocol um, agreed to an amendment to phase down the use of HFCs uh, globally. Uh, the amendment is in force, although the U.S. has not yet ratified, but the AIM Act actually adopts the, the, the tenets of the, the amendment uh, and would act as implementing legislation to that amendment. Um, uh, there is a requirement in the amendment that says that during the transition away from high global warming potential HFCs, uh, that energy efficiency must be maintained or enhanced. Um, and so uh, there has been an ex a significant body of work completed to explore and understand the impact of changing refrigerants and the impact on energy efficiency. Uh, so um, I, I, I can provide uh, links to those reports. There have been five of them with a number of addendums to them. Uh, a, a significant body of the work uh, since 2016. Um, and so I'm happy to provide that if people are interested in that. But maybe I could just point to a single case study. Uh, the Ahold grocery change in the, in the Netherlands um, uh, decided that they would test out one of these lower GWP refrigerants. So that was a 449, so like the 448 that Mr. Lebrecht showed. Um, uh, and they found that they reduced their energy consumption in their grocery store chain by 8%. Um, and so they actually saved so much money that they decided to uh, transition 200 of their stores, even though they weren't required to at that time, they decided to transition 200 stores uh, so that they would have the financial savings from the energy consumption. And I'm happy to report, uh, provide that report as well, if uh, people are so interested. Um, so from an energy efficiency perspective, um, certainly that is um, something that has been very carefully examined uh, both nationally and inter internationally. Uh, there are also Department of Energy standards that must be complied with, uh, both, both, um, uh, both minimals uh, for e different equipment types around the country. Um, so from an energy efficiency perspective, I think that's very important to note. I would also mention that uh, Mr. Lebrecht has some very unique and wonderfully designed equipment um, uh, that I think um, is very interesting. And I, I, I would love to have an opportunity to talk with him offline uh, uh, if, uh, uh, and I'll try to find a way to reach out to him uh, to have a further discussion around, uh, around this issue. But uh, he has some very, very nicely designed equipment that's very appropriate for uh, certain types of architectures in grocery stores. It may not work for all architectures. And of course, um, uh, you know, from a new store and new equipment perspective, uh, it, it, is, it is very small con compared to the existing footprint. Um, uh, and, 
and as people move forward and they use much larger equipment types, uh, they, um, there is still a need to uh, move to the lower GWP refrigerants from that perspective because these leak rates are so high. So um, I, I agree fully that a longer term and uh, with the implementation of the AIM Act nationally, uh, there will be pressure on the supply of refrigerants. Um, uh, and so we will see that uh, people are moving away and working very hard to reduce leak rates. Um, we're working to educate retailers um, uh, together with our members around uh, the options in their toolkit to uh, do things to reduce leaks as well as um, do a good job of collecting refrigerant at the end of life and so on. And these will all be very important features going forward. But, um, uh, but the, there is still a significant opportunity here uh, with the maintaining of energy efficiency standards. I would also note that in the legislation, there is a waiver process um, uh, that Mr. Lebrecht could use with the with the agency to uh, continue to uh, to market and sell his equipment uh, with the other refrigerants in it, um, uh, so that this equipment is available to people to use as designed without him having to redesign to use a lower GWP refrigerant. Representative Tucker, I hope I've addressed <laughs> what you were looking for. Uh, yes. Um... Uh, you have. I just wanted to kind of get to the bottom line here about whether the EPA and the international agencies uh, have studied whether or not reducing HFCs is going to be counterbalanced by an increase in use of CO2 that will wipe out the benefits. And what are the conclusions of those studies? They, they have studied this, uh, this issue very, very carefully um, over the past five years in great, great detail. Uh, but of course, there are many studies that were earlier than that as well. Uh, and their conclusion is that the refrigerant has very little impact uh, to the overall energy efficiency. It's really a question of, of equipment design. And you can see where Mr. Lebrecht's design, are, 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 it's a very, very good design from an energy efficiency perspective. Um, and that type of equipment design and actually the maintenance of equipment are very, very important uh, to energy efficiency going forward. Uh, my other question would be, um, do you see any practicality in requiring a, uh, an evaluation of the net GH, uh, the net greenhouse gas effects of given models um, of equipment? Uh, so um, because of the requirement to maintain or enhance energy efficiency, um, that work has largely already been done. Um, and uh, so that information is quite available. Um, and, uh, and again, uh, this is really about equipment design. And as we see, uh, you know, uh, people convert to more energy efficient equipment. Now the DOE standards are in place uh, today for commercial refrigeration equipment. Uh, people will be required to meet those, uh, those levels uh, regardless of the refrigerant that they use. In the future, as equipment wears out, and it has to be replaced in the future. I understand the equipment is all grandfathered. Once the new equipment is purchased, uh, once we get into the future, will, for those pieces of equipment that are coming towards the end of their lifetime, will they be able to get parts and refrigerant uh, that has been banned? in order to continue the grandfather process? Uh, yes, so, uh, so as you uh, so aptly uh, noted, uh, Representative Tucker, uh, there is no requirement for, uh, for anybody to replace their equipment in, in this legislation. Uh, the AIM Act does phase down the availability of refrigerants uh, at the federal level, uh, so that is coming, but uh, there will be components. Um, I, I, maybe a couple examples uh, for you. Uh, when halons re were replaced, so that would be the fire suppressants um, that are used 
especially on board um, aircrafts. Uh, you have to have very low toxicity and very good fire suppressant capability uh, to use the fire suppressant on an aircraft. And there have been no inventions that were sufficient uh, to replace them. Uh, the last halons were produced in this country uh, more than 20 years ago. And halon continues to be available. The parts continue to be available. And the new aircrafts that are, are uh, built today still use halon systems uh, with those recovered and reclaimed um, halons uh, today. Uh, refrigerants the same way. There are systems out there that are 30 years old, 40 years old, using old, old CFC technology, uh, the old ozone depleting substances, and still they're able to access uh, recovered refrigerant today. And that, that's still available and they're still able to get parts. So uh, we, uh, this industry has a long history uh, around these transitions and, uh, and continuing to maintain equipment for a very long time. Thank you. Representative Hanley. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Warren uh, T. Roney. Am I ruining your name or did I do that okay? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, the improvements that you talked about uh, in energy efficiency, was that due to the design of the system or was it due to the chemical? Which, which one helped with that? Um, so the, the example that I gave of Ajo, they actually did not make any system changes. They just um, retuned some valves. Uh, so they were very fortunate and didn't need to make any changes. And uh, the refrigerant enhanced energy efficiency, this 8%. But in other cases, uh, you know, there's a lot of different refrigerants out there. There's going to be a lot of changes that are made. But the, what they found is that the uh, the refrigerant impact to energy efficiency, the change would be uh, maybe five percent up or down. I, I don't know of any examples where energy efficiency has been made worse, um, uh, but certainly some that where it's made better. Uh, well, I, I take that back. Excuse me. Uh, I would say that carbon dioxide has some re, uh, energy efficiency challenges, but uh, but there are um, there. But uh, folks have made uh, wonderful inroads in equipment design uh, to make sure that carbon dioxide equipment uh, meets those standards. And because the Department of Energy has requirements now uh, that different from before, uh, they now have requirements around minimum energy efficiency requirements, and those will continue to increase over time. Uh, regardless of the refrigerant used, uh, the equipment manufacturers will be improving the energy efficiency of that equipment. So it's, it's largely due to equipment and wonderful designs like Mr. Lebrecht's design, um, but, but uh, there is you know, a very minor difference between energy efficiency of refrigerants. A follow-up, if I may. Yeah, please. Um, how, how about the organization you represent? What's the, um, do they have any engineering standards that they're working on to, as Mr. Lebrecht very clearly demonstrated, the, the problem isn't chemicals. The problem is leakage of chemicals. Is your organization, is that one of their hot issues? So, um, so our organization does make equipment design standards and uh, um, uh, certifies uh, testing of energy efficiency capability. Um, however, I think the problem that Mr. Lebrecht and I both agree is a major problem is around the maintenance equ of equipment long term. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, the Clean Air Act Section 608 um, is where uh, the national rules are around how much uh, around how refrigerant leakage. Uh, unfortunately, those, uh, those requirements for HFCs were challenged in the courts, um, and so those are no longer uh, in play in the same way. Um, but my hope is that with the AIM Act that we'll see those uh, reinstated uh, because uh, this refrigerant leakage issue is a very, very important one, as, as Mr. Lebrecht uh, talked about. A follow-up, if I may. Mm -hmm. So would your organization be willing to look at minimum standards of material types and designs uh, for a nationwide uh, level or statewide level, because in our case here, statewide, but we are, is your organization willing to support that kind of uh, legislation? So we, uh, you know, we work um, kind of on a performance basis. We try not to be prescriptive in design, uh, Representative Hanley. Um, so uh, uh, it's more around performance. So uh, if you can meet a certain energy efficiency level, uh, with the design of your equipment. Um, but, but I would say that I think that Mr. Lebrecht's equipment is, is very special and unique. And I think um, 
you know, uh, I think that he could likely meet uh, very good performance standards. And, um, uh, and as those performance standards increase over time at the Department of Energy and other places, um, that, uh, that um, you know, he, he certainly will have an advantage. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if that's helpful, Mr. Hanley, and I would have to go back and ask folks around the standards piece of this question uh, because I, I don't have a feel for, uh, for that very well at this time. Right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any follow-up or additional comments or questions for Ms. Walter Taranoni? All right, thank you. So Thank much you. for joining us. It strikes me, I guess, that if we were to move in the direction of placing something like specific directives to mechanical issues, we could potentially be limiting innovation if we don't tag it to efficiency standards. Sorry, are you asking me? Sorry. <laughs> I'm just making a comment. Chair's Liberty. It's my moment. All right, Representative Judera. Well, I was I was thinking along the same lines. And I mean, I, I feel like, you know, we all want to do our best and we want we want grocery stores, we want supermarkets, we want people to do their best. And certainly maintenance is always important in taking care of any equipment. But let's face it, as careful as people are things are going to happen and leaks are probably going to occur, occur that people don't realize. And, you know, that's why it's important to have chemicals that are going to cause the least amount of damage to the environment as much as we try to make sure that people maintain their equipment, it's still going to happen. And so I think that that's just, you know, we do our best, but that's a fact. Representative Hanley. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just as uh, from a life uh, experience standpoint, uh, before I became involved in government, my uh, occupation was a welder and a pipe fitter and electrician. And I actually worked on and installed huge air conditioning systems. And the, the refrigerant replacement was a constant issue. And we finally put in a system that was 100% stainless steel and all welded joints. And the leak issues went away. That's why I keep promoting the idea of engineering standards for materials and procedures. And I think uh, Mr. LeBrecht's presentation was the uh, icing on the cake, so to speak. So I think that's where legislation is gonna have to go eventually. If you're serious about, st it's not, Efficiency is chemical leaks that is our issue, really. And uh, I think that's where we're gonna have to eventually go with this. Representative Tucker. Uh, my last request would be to ask if uh, Mr. Jeffrey Crawford from the DEP could address this specific issue of energy efficiency and how it would be regulated here in Maine. Sabrina, could you please move Mr. Crawford over to our meeting space? And Representative O'Connor. Thank you, Madam Chair. So. It's on, on another note, and for the life of me, I can't remember who the individual was that spoke to us about the boat building industry. I think I'm on the second to last page of the legislation, and it has a, um, a date that they can comply, but they use um, this material for the hulls of their boats to, to make them strong, is, was my understanding. And I'm looking at, um, it says uh, 2023 for the first date, 2025 for the second date. And I'm wondering if there is a replacement for that particular product yet that they would be able to use because I know that boat building, um, having grown up in a town where we built a lot of boats, 
we would take orders or the individuals that worked in the boating industry would take orders two and three years in advance for some of these some of these boats which would limit the orders that they could take so um, if there's someone who can talk about that issue that that's that's really that's that's an issue that I think that we need to deal with as well thank you Representative Tucker, you mentioned this once already this morning. Do you want to address it again? Yes, and then and then do a lateral pass to Mr. S Mr. Crawford. Um, this boat building concern, I looked into it. We got a copy of the recent legislation, the so-called AIM Act, uh, from uh, last year, and. It turns out that the maritime boat building industry has got an absolute exemption from all of these requirements for the next five years. And that federal statute specifically preempts our state law. Not only that, that law also dangles the possibility of a second five-year extension. And Mr. Crawford can correct me if I'm wrong. Not to mention that if there's a major problem that affects a major industry, we also have a waiver provision in our statute, in this proposed statute, that would allow us to address on a regulatory basis specific problems of compliance if there are no alternatives. So I basically, uh, and the, the lady, I forget her name. Uh, let's see if she's on the list here. I, I think, I don't see her today, probably because she wrote us a letter back and said she was satisfied and that she wasn't worried anymore. It was Stacy Kiefer. Stacy, yeah. Stacy got back to us and she sent a letter around. And um, so that, that part of the anxiety can, can have a little bit of assurance I'd like to, um, if I may, can I introduce Mr. Crawford? Yes, please. We all know Mr. Crawford, of course, but uh, could you please address the issue that we were talking about today, which is Representative Lifer's worry, his, his speculative concern about whether replacing equipment in the future with HFC compliant equipment will be less efficient, generate CO2 due to the um, increased use of energy and, and offset any advantages that we're getting in the elimination of HFCs. And, so what, are your thank you, representative. and what are your regulatory powers in that regard? Sure, thank you, Representative Tucker. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, if we replace some of the older, higher global warming potential HFCs, the newer ones, uh, are we going to see an increase or decrease in energy efficiency? And if you look at the literature, you look at all the research, uh, if you listen to some of the uh, witnesses we've had either during the public hearing or today during the work session, I think the answer is that it certainly won't cause a decrease. And in many cases, the newer refrigerants can cause an increase in energy efficiency. Uh, not in every case, not in every application. Uh, I was reading a study the other day that showed that there was a slight decrease uh, in one of the replacements for cold temperature storage in uh, refrigeration, for example, storing ice cream. Uh, on the other hand, there was a significant increase in energy efficiency by simply using that replacement in medium temperature cooling uh, meat storage at a, at a grocery store, perhaps the beer cooler. Uh, and there's a lot more of that than there is with, with frozen or, or very cold temperature refrigeration. Um, the shorter the answer, and I think we've heard it before, we heard it from Mr. Lebrecht, uh, equipment leaks certainly need to be addressed. Uh, they continue to be a problem and unfortunately will likely continue to be a problem for the for the foreseeable future, uh, the replacement refrigerants uh, will be equivalent or provide 
additional energy efficiency benefits and you know recognizing that most of the energy efficiency improvements are in fact related to the mechanical process itself so given that we have department of energy requirements for energy efficiency uh, whether their product just be uh, meet the general standards uh, for smaller products whether it be energy star certified I'm pretty comfortable that moving forward, we're going to see improved energy efficiency, not decreased, uh, again, across the board, if not in every case. Representative Tucker, did you have a follow-up? May I please? Thank you. Um, given the fact that this is, uh, compact legislation, meaning that it, we're following a pattern that's being enacted across the country in, in 26 different states, moving along with federal legislation on a parallel course, there's a certain requirement for consistency in the legislation. My question is, have you run across in other states any specific provision that requires that a net analysis of greenhouse effect be done on specific models to evaluate this HFC versus energy efficiency issue. And if, if there is, how would you go about determining that as a regulatory agency? I haven't. Uh, in fact, if I remember correctly, US EPA, when they promulgated their uh, SNAP or significant alternative uh, policy rules for HFCs, uh, you know, looked into this and whether or not it was practical for even US EPA that has a very large staff and a lot of resources to evaluate all the possible alternatives for uh, equipment design and refrigerants. And they concluded that, no, they can't look at each and every case. They can't do a case by case evaluation. What they do look is to see whether a particular alternative uh, makes it impossible for end users to again meet, you know, Department of Energy, energy efficiency requirements. Uh, and they concurred that you know, the replacements that they listed uh, would enable uh, facilities, manufacturers, users to meet those requirements. Now, we aren't doing the SNAP rule here, but I think it's important to remember that the, uh, you know, 26 states that are looking at these measures are in fact modeling their rules off the SNAP rule. So the answer in short is uh, no, we certainly don't have the resources if US EPA doesn't have the resources. Uh, it might be possible to look at an individual unit. Uh, you know, I believe as uh, Ms. Walter Terranini mentioned on a waiver type basis, but uh, to, to do any kind of a broad scale analysis would be far beyond our ability. I have five engineers in the Air Bureau. And a lot of red tape. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, that's it for me. Representative Hanley. Yes, thank you. Uh, my question is, are we afraid of being in a patchwork situation here that uh, Maine might be an outlier or uh, we might do something ahead of other states that we'll discover we should let come back and re readjust? Is that a possibility with this legislation? I don't believe so. Uh, when you look at states that have already adopted this program in the Northeast, I mean, we've got Vermont, Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Rhode Island's in the middle of rulemaking. Uh, Connecticut, at least, is talking about rulemaking, uh, with the exception, perhaps, of our neighbors in New Hampshire. Uh, the, most all of the states in the Northeast are adopting similar rules. Uh, there's similar requirements out in Colorado, California, Washington. So uh, I think what will happen, uh, you will end up ultimately with, once a critical mass is reached, is the, the appliance manufacturers transitioning to uh, these type of refrigerants for all appliances. So I think that's the key. We need to make sure that there's a critical mass of states uh, so that really we, we drive it on a nationwide basis. Uh, thank you. Follow up, Madam Speaker? Sure. Yes. 
Yes. Uh, again, I, I, we worry that we might have to come back. These states that you just listed off, is the legislation identical to what we're dealing with here? Or are we just kind of hitting the edge? Yeah, it's, it's, it's substantially the same. And let me, let me explain the, the term substantially. There are minor differences in the definitions. For example, if you were to go into New York State's definitions, uh, they include the same categories we have for the most part. Uh, the definitions cover the same uh, uh, refrigerants or sources. Uh, they're perhaps less fleshed out. They're a little less uh, detailed, if you will. Uh, probably the, the only real substantive difference between this proposal and proposals in other states are the inclusion of the waiver provisions that we have in subsection four, I believe it is, in the amendment. And uh, there are only a handful of states that have language uh, uh, looking at conformity with any rules that EPA may do under the SNAP program. That's in section six. Uh, Delaware, New Jersey, Washington, California, some of the earlier adopters of this program included that language. Uh, the, the later states did not. As far as the actual limits uh, within each uh, category, for example, uh, uh, air conditioners, uh, they're all the same as far as I know. So which refrigerants you can use for a specific use? So simply implementation dates and minor differences in definitions and so forth. Representative Haley, could you have a follow up? Nope. Any other questions, thoughts? Anybody else have any comments about the legislation? They want to make sure we hear. Nothing. Representative Tucker. You're on mute, Representative. I think um, we've all got a lot to think about. Um, unless there's further discussion that the committee wants to have now, I, I just as soon uh, take some time and come back and go through, do a markup on the whole bill uh, at another work session. Is, would that be agreeable to you, Mr. Hanley? Uh, yes, I, I would like to do that. That would be a good thing. Okay, therefore, I, I move we table this bill. And I'll second that motion. All right, show of hands to table the bill. All right. There you have it. LD226 is tabled for a further work session. All right, are there any other bits of information we need to make sure we address today? Any housekeeping items? No. Representative Tucker. Is it true that we might be adjourning next week? <laughs> we shall see. I was told in, uh, in caucus this morning, or rather in, 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 in chairs meeting for the house, uh, that one of the suggestions, if, if we do uh, adjourn, is that there could be a provision that committee work would continue. And so that, uh, that obviously is, is up, up for debate, of course, um, amongst leadership, but I don't think I'm telling any secrets. Uh, if I know it, it's certainly not a secret. Um, and so I just wanted to pass along that information I picked up. Thank you, Representative Tucker. Well, I do look forward to seeing you all on Monday and then I believe in person on Tuesday. A motion to adjourn. So moved. Great. Have a great afternoon, everyone. <laughs>